Without a doubt, one of the topics that interests me most in science is evolution. Now, I don't claim to understand its inner workings thoroughly, but I think I've got a competent handle on most aspects of evolution. So when I saw a video from someone called The Mask of Science, a channel dedicated to debunking evolution, my interest was piqued. And it turns out he's a blimmin' doctor. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Four Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, I think it's fair to say that 999 times out of a thousand, an anti-evolution video is created by some sort of creationist. Now, I'm not saying that all Christians don't believe in evolution. I'm saying that almost all anti-evolutionists are creationists. Having said that, I'm not sure where today's video subject, John B. Andelin, MD, falls on that spectrum. There's only one way to find out, I guess. We join John as he starts his presentation. Today I'm going to discuss one of the many reasons why evolution is impossible. Now if someone tries to convince you of evolution, you'll probably be told that it's supported by multiple independent lines of overwhelming scientific evidence. And when this happens, you're being told, trust me, I'm a scientist, I have credentials, and evolution did occur. No, you're being shown evidence that you can look up yourself. Tens of thousands of papers are available all showing the same thing. That evolution is a fact and in the last 150 years it has remained unfalsifiable. But you're not being given a plausible explanation as to how evolution could occur through laws of science. If you want to know how evolution could actually occur, you're likely to be given very superficial explanations. For example, you might be told that humans evolved from apes, and a fragmented line of fossils is presented as evidence. Well, I hope you aren't told that. Now, you may be told that humans are apes, and they evolved from ape-like creatures between six and eight million years ago. That would be correct. But how did this happen? How did higher intelligence evolve from lower intelligence? You won't be told how. Well, if you did some research, you would have found out that human intelligence likely evolved from the larger and larger social groups that were becoming more prevalent in early human species. Primates, as a rule, are extraordinarily intelligent, but we just appear to be extra specially so. Other than the brain got larger, perhaps through enhanced nutrition. Didn't even say that, but yes, that would have helped too. But how could mutations create the complex integrated circuitry of a brain? Not all brains are complex, my friend. So many jokes there, but I'll refrain. The tardigrade has a brain containing about 200 neurons. The human brain, for comparison, has around 86 billion. These questions are never addressed because there are no answers. Well, that's your video debunk then, because I just answered them. But these good people have come to see more than this, so let's continue. Today I'm going to analyze the substance of the proposed mechanism of evolution so that you can judge for yourself based on very straightforward logic. Essentially everyone who has believed in evolution from Darwin's day to now has relied on false concepts of inheritance. Darwin described the mechanism of evolution as random variations plus natural selection plus time, and he termed this descent with modification. This is a paradigm that's promulgated in virtually every college level biology class and it is utterly false. Write a paper then John. I mean you're a doctor after all. Get it peer reviewed. Show us the reason why you think it's false. No one's going to take a YouTube video about it seriously, are they? With the understanding of DNA, it's now known that the only way that evolution could possibly occur would be a fundamental change or mutation to occur in a genetic code, not selection of pre-existing variations. Now this proposed mechanism of evolution is one of the most illogical extrapolations of modern science. What they're doing is observing traits that are known to vary, such as eye color, skull shape, stature, etc., and extending these observations to explain the origin of fixed traits for which there is no variation such as the microarchitecture of a feather or metabolic pathways in humans. A dark moth can be favored by natural selection in a polluted environment, 
This doesn't explain how a whale could evolve from a land mammal. Actually, it does. Now imagine you were a land mammal that lived hundreds of millions of years ago, and you were a part of a herd that lived close to some water. Now, you and your best buddy Dave enjoy a munch on the vegetation which grows just right by the water's edge. Now you've got a taste for it and Dave's becoming slightly addicted. Now, it turns out that whilst you're both chowing down on that vegetation, it does a great job at concealing you from your natural predator. Now after a while you notice that the herd has thinned somewhat. Jimmy and Bobby, who love the vegetation inland, have been missing for months. Now you and Dave start your own families with female counterparts and you ensure that the whole family eats this vegetation that grows right near the water. Eventually, the entire herd is gone and it's just you, Dave, your kids and all your grandkids. And from now on, the generations that followed spent more and more time in or near the water. And one of Dave's great, 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 great grandchildren was born with toes that are slightly stuck together. You see where this is going, John? When a cow reproduces, there are variations in offspring, such as color, size, presence or absence of horns, resistant to disease, etc. But these variations are bounded, and everyone knows this. You can begin with a wild cow and create a breed of cow that produces more milk. You can't create a dolphin from a cow by just continuing the process for millions of years because that would require fundamental change, not selection of pre-existing genetic variants that are already in the population. Okay, two things here. First off, what you've just described there is artificial selection. Something which we have done as a species for hundreds if not thousands of years. And we've domesticated the cat and the dog to live with us from wild cats and wolves respectively. We've created hundreds of breeds of cattle, all for varying purposes. All done using the methods you've just described over a relatively short period of time. Now artificial selection is not natural selection, is it? Natural selection doesn't pick traits and then breed based off of those traits. Natural selection is just that, natural. It's nuanced, subtle, delicate, and slow. Secondly, the modern whale did not evolve from the modern cow. Huge straw man there. Let's consider the proposed evolution of the whale in terms of this proposal, descent with modification. If a whale evolved from a land-based mammal such as a cow, Tail flukes couldn't have been created by simply modifying the cow's tail. But the whale did not evolve from a land-based mammal like a cow. They evolved from some type of ungulate creature. Now that just means a mammal, any mammal, with hooves. And you can literally see the evidence for this in modern day whales with their vestigial legs. Anti-evolutionists make the same mistake over and over again. No animal evolved from any other animal alive today. None of the cow's offspring ever have a variation that could be construed as a step in the evolution of a whale's tail. And why would they? We're not expecting them to. Do you think a cow-type creature one day was born with a tail like a whale? That's so naive. Fundamental change would be required, and this means mutation, resulting in new genetic information. Nevertheless, this central Darwinian mechanism, random mutations plus natural selection plus time, is simplistically applied to every complexity of nature, known and unknown. This is an imagined mechanism. It has never been demonstrated to work, and based on observation and common sense, it doesn't work. The modern theory of evolution says that if you take a cow and add mutations and millions of years of natural selection, you can end up with a whale. Not a modern cow, but I think I've made that point enough now. So let's consider some important elements of this proposed mechanism. First, Mutations, the source of all evolution, are random. This means that if a mutation occurs, it is independent of the one that preceded it and the one that follows it. If a mutation did occur that resulted in incipient tail flukes in an evolving marine mammal, that doesn't enhance the likelihood that another mutation is going to appear to improve upon the early design. If a mutation did result in incipient tail flukes, no variations or alleles of that trait will suddenly appear in the population to allow for future refinement of that design. The genetic variations in humans, according to evolutionary theory, took hundreds of thousands of years to appear in the population. Indeed, but mutations don't happen all of the time. They are pretty rare, which is why it takes so long for them to affect any particular species over time. Second point. 
the environment doesn't prompt the appearance of a mutation. You simply cannot make that statement. A stressful and hazardous environment can certainly prompt mutation. There is no guarantee what that mutation will be though. If a mammal is starting to spend more and more time in the ocean, any mutation that appears in the population could affect any system. A mutation could result in the deregulation of a pancreatic enzyme, bone marrow suppression, or any of trillions of other possibilities. Life in the ocean does not increase the likelihood that a mutation will occur that involves the modification of a tail for swimming. A mutation creating incipient tail flukes is just as likely to appear in a rat or a giraffe as it is in an animal that's starting to live in the ocean. Okay, whilst extremely unlikely, it would not be advantageous to a rat or a giraffe, would it? And any particular individual that had that mutation would die and not pass it on. And it's the same with other negative mutations. That mutation, the genes for it, would not be passed on if it was detrimental to health. However, if it was advantageous, like a tail fluke in a previously land-based mammal, and that allowed it to swim better, then it would be passed on, wouldn't it? You are literally explaining natural selection here, John. Some people look at the body of a streamlined dolphin and are amazed how the ocean shaped its anatomy. Bear in mind that according to evolutionary theory, mutations are the engine of evolution, not the ocean. All mutations that end up looking like they happened because they are in the ocean, happened because they are in the ocean. All other mutations would have been lost when individuals died. As I said, it is very subtle, but you can definitely see how mutations that have helped an animal survive in a particular environment look like they've been cherry-picked for that animal. Now this is the best way I can describe it, bear with me. It's like trying to catch three red balls from 10,000 blue balls that are being dropped from above you in the sky. Now it may take a lot of drops, but eventually you will catch all three of those balls. But if you come along and see me holding those three red balls, you would just assume it was easy and I was holding them the whole time. More natural selection proof, John. Point number three. No acquired characteristics can be transmitted to offspring. If an evolving marine mammal spent its entire life increasing its ability to swim, that trait is not passed on to the young. And no one has ever said that it does. Now this principle was unknown during Darwin's time, and virtually all biologists who accepted evolution believed that characteristics acquired during life could somehow be passed on to the offspring. Oh yeah, Lamarck said that. Okay, today though, today. No one will ever say that today, it's just not how it works. And the fourth point, no evolution can occur for a future purpose. All changes must result in direct, short-term survival advantages. I think John's issue here is he just doesn't understand natural selection. Natural selection doesn't try to operate for future advantages. Some things work, some things don't. So if a whale's ability to navigate from the tropics to the poles came about through mutations, each incremental step had to confer an immediate survival advantage. Try to imagine that. Many evolutionary explanations imply that future advantages have driven evolution toward a goal because they can't be logically explained through known laws of biology. For example, in virtually every published article that attempts to explain the origin of sexual reproduction, invariably future advantages are cited. This constitutes a tacit admission of the need for intelligent design. Bingo! There we have it. I knew it would be. That means everything else you now say, and even everything else you've said previous, comes from a faith-based belief with no evidence. So that means everyone, we're done. Arguing against evolution when you are a creationist is like having a Man United fan referee a Manchester United game. It's just not fair. Well, there we go, a great finish there for that video. Let me know in the comments if you want me to look at more of John's stuff, but for now, we are all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching, it truly is appreciated. If you enjoyed it today, please do consider subscribing. We're now only just over 10,000 away from the half a million subscribers. Um, it's gonna be soon, very, very soon, maybe a couple of months. And of course, if you really enjoyed it, hit that thumbs up button too. I've been Simon and Dan, have yourselves a great week, and I'll see you all on Friday for the return of Mikey Smith. See you then.